Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you that we can gather as your people, and thank you that you are a God who speaks. That you speak personally and individually to us. You have spoken through, to your people through the ages. You speak through your word, and your word is not something that is just static, but your Holy Spirit illumines your word to our hearts and minds. So we thank you for that. And we pray that as we look at a passage of Scripture this morning, a passage that quite often we just fast forward through, I pray that we would pause long enough to hear your voice. May we understand your message to our heart. For we ask this in Jesus' name. I don't think I really deserved the A that I got on that social assignment years ago when I was in high school. We were asked to talk to our parents, or if we could, maybe a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle, and then to write a bit of a report about our family history, including any particularly interesting or notable relatives. So I talked to my dad a little bit about you know, coming to Canada from Holland, and he told me a little bit that they had someone in our family that was a mayor of a town in Holland. Now the word was called Burgemeester or something like that, mayor of a town het built in Holland. So I wrote some of that up in the, in the paper, and when the teacher handed back the assignments, he mentioned two people who'd done very well in the assignment, and one was me, who had this ancestor who was a mayor in Holland, and another one was another student who discovered that one of his ancestors had lost at a card game with a famous outlaw, Jesse James. So <laughs> and apparently he didn't push the issue at all, so he lived to survive to tell, the, to tell the tale. I was glad that I got a good mark. I thought, well, did I just get a good mark because I had an interesting story? What about people if you had boring relatives? Did you not get a good mark on that? I'm sure there were other criteria for the marks on that, so I was good, glad, glad to get a good mark. So I was reminded of that assignment as I looked at a list of names for this passage this morning. And I remember Dad telling me about that, that relative in, in Holland. I didn't remember much about it, but I remembered that word that he said, Burgemeester, or something like that. And uh, so for a qu couple of quick Google searches, one to say, what is actually that Dutch word for uh, uh, a mayor? And then put that Dutch word in along with my last name, Andringa, and I come up with chart on Marius Albert van Andringa de Kampenayer. Aren't you glad that they've shortened my last name? Wouldn't you just love to call me Pastor van Andringa de Kempenayer? <laughs> That's all. But anyway, he lived in the 1800s from 1806 to 1870 and was a mayor and a member of provincial council and a member of the Senate of the States General in the Netherlands. So interesting what you can find out with just a few tools. And now, of course, today we've got all those ancestry tools that you can delve a lot deeper to tell us a little bit about family history. Maybe you've used some of your tools, those tools, and so maybe you do know the first name of your grandparents, great-grandparents, or great-great-grandparents. We lose those pretty quickly, don't we? How, much, how many, unless you've just got it down on, you know, in one of your little books somewhere of your family history, you don't know those names. But roots are important in shaping who we are whether we're familiar or unfamiliar with our roots. But in ancient times, ancestry was given a higher priority. And certainly it was very important in biblical days. So when Matthew was going to write an account of the life of Jesus, he started by talking about Jesus' roots. Now we often overlook chapter 1 of Matthew because we see just a list of hard-to-pronounce names. But I want to look at that list today as it contains some fascinating insights. I think Matthew would have gotten A on his assignment as well. Mind you, he was writing with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, so I guess that helps as, a, uh, as well. I'm starting this short series called The Obscure Messiah. A key purpose of the book of Matthew was to convince people that Jesus of Nazareth was indeed the Messiah. Matthew 16, the famous chapter, Jesus asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? He'd become a well-known teacher, a miracle worker, but they didn't know much about him, and so some speculated that he could be a prophet or Elijah come back to life. But Matthew wants to convince his readers that Jesus is indeed the promised Messiah. So he begins with the list of Jesus' ancestors, and the list demonstrates that Jesus is from the line of promise. In fact, the book of Matthew refers to Jesus as the son of David ten times, and actually refers to David 17 times. That's very important in the book of, of Matthew. But for many reading the book for the first time, Jesus was to them just a teacher that had been known for a few years. 
had died an early death at the instigation of the Jewish leaders and at the hands of the Romans. And since that time, there are these stories creeping up, these fantastic stories that he'd risen from the dead and there were people that were following him. And people that were following him that were Jewish were claiming that he was the promised Messiah. So who was this teacher anyway? That's the question that Matthew addresses throughout his gospel. It's a, it's a book that talks about identity. Now, I'm not going to read all 41 names that are listed in the genealogy, but I'm going to read a good percentage of them, and then we're going to look at those names. So you can follow along in your Bible or on the screen or whatever works best for you. Matthew chapter 1. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Aminadab. Aminadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, Abijah, the father of Asa, Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram, Jehoram, the father of Uzziah, Uzziah, the father of Jotham, Jotham, the father of Ahaz, Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, Manasseh, the father of Ammon, Ammon, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon, after the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shalatiel, Shalatiel, the father of Zerubbabel. And we're going to skip to verse 16. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Thus there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, from 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. I think I should get a Christmas bonus just for reading through all those names or something like that, right? You know, so, but, uh, so when we read the Christmas story, we often skip the genealogies that are listed in both Matthew and Luke. We focus on the manger scene that's described in Luke, and often we'll import the wise men from Matthew, even though it says that they were at the house and were probably about two years later. These genealogies were important to the original audience. The term Messiah that we still, three times we saw it in that, in that text. That would serve as the headline. I mean, they didn't have the ability to sort of put big, bold font and all of those kinds of things, but that was the headline. The headline on this was the Messiah. The purpose was to validate Jesus as being the right bloodline, having the roots to being the Messiah. But it's written in a way that would immediately both annoy and intrigue those who first read it. First, it's saying with that headline, the Messiah, and it not only verifies the identity of Jesus, it compels the reader to keep reading. We just skim the list of names so we can get to the angel appearing to Joseph and to the visit of the wise men. And then we skip over the story of the babies in Bethlehem. That isn't a very nice story. And we don't know what to make about the excursion to Egypt and then back to, to Nazareth. We're going to look at some of those things in, the, in this obscure Messiah passage as we go through Matthew chapter 1 and 2. But Matthew's introduction... His genealogy is far different than the stories, the biographies, the genealogies of most famous and powerful people at the time. You see, in ancient times, history wasn't written by objective reporters. Is that an oxymoron? <laughs> objective reporters? Uh, even today, we don't have completely objective reporters. But then it was more so the way because history was written by these historians who were paid by a king and that king had the life and death power over his subjects. So if you're writing the story about a king, what would you include? What would you conveniently exclude? And that's how history was written. Ancient, ancient histories were written with a huge bias. The triumphs of the king are exaggerated, the defeats are minimized or even conveniently overlooked, and the positive qualities of the king, either real or imagined, are praised, and the flaws are ignored. But Matthew writes this genealogy, and starting from the beginning, he includes details that most authors would omit. Details that you wouldn't include if you're trying to impress people and convert people to your point of view. 
So let's notice some of those details, and I'm going to just mention them first with a little bit about them, and then we'll ask the question, why did he include these details? So what are some of these details in the story? They're details that for Jewish people reading this would be kind of awkward or kind of embarrassing. First, did you notice how often it mentioned the exile? One of the most disappointing and embarrassing eras in Israel's history. He could have just listed the kings, but twice in the list he brings up the exile and mentions it again and, and anchors his whole genealogy to the time of uh, the, the exile. And all Jews knew that story. If you're trying to impress someone with your roots, you don't remind them of the time when God's chosen people were so disobedient and rebellious that God sent them into exile for 70 years. Now, kids might think they're being harshly punished if they have a 15-minute timeout, or teens might be harshly punished if you take your phone, their phone away for a few hours or for a day. Uh, I heard this week that the best way to punish teens is you don't take their phone away, you take their charger away. And they just leave it at <laughs> Let's see how long they can last. And yeah, let's see if they, yeah, that. Anyway, I'm sorry, kids, you're, you're just, uh, yeah. So the people of Israel had a 70-year time out. They were acting so badly. Matthew wants people to let people know that Jesus is a promised ruler. But he also wanted to let them know that he is a ruler like any other ruler. And so he starts, and in this genealogy, he includes details that would make the readers feel awkward, even uncomfortable by pointing to their painful past. So he includes details about the exile. Now, did you notice also as we read through that? that in that, there are four infamous women that are included. This was not expected, because in that time, you usually didn't refer to women when you were writing a genealogy, because they didn't have a lot of rights, they didn't have a lot of influence. And if you did include some women, they better be some fairly important and impressive women. So if you were writing a genealogy and writing about the Jewish people, what women would you include? Sarah? the wife of Abraham who had a baby in her old age, that would be a good one. How about Miriam, the sister of Moses, who wrote that, uh, that, that song after the, at the deliverance from the Red Sea? How about Deborah, the judge, who delivered the people from Sisera? Or in that story, that, uh, that gal named Jael, who had that famous incident with the tent peg. I won't go into details about, uh, about that one. And if you were listing famous women, wouldn't you have to include Ruth? Or, uh, well, not Ruth, what, you have to, Esther, I mean, who saved the people against the conniving and evil Haman in the time of King Xerxes. Those were women that you would include, but he doesn't include those. Instead, he includes four others. Not only he, does he remind the readers of the painful story of their past when they were in a 70-year timeout, he includes four women others would think should be ignored or excluded. One was Tamar. Tamar was the daughter-in-law of Judah. Judah was one of Jacob's sons. And you read the story, you wonder why Judah at all carries a line of promise. After all, he wasn't the first son, and by his lifestyle, we see he wasn't the finest son. And the story of him and his daughter-in-law isn't the type of story that you usually read in Sunday school, and you don't even read it in church, so I'm not going to go to Genesis 38 and read the whole uh, details uh, of that story. But suffice it to say that both Judah and his daughter-in-law, Tamar, made some poor choices, and as a result of those choices, uh, some twin boys were born, and they became part of the family history. And Matthew draws a big red circle around that scandal described in Genesis 38. Not only by saying that Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, but reminding the people whose mother was Tamar. Okay, how about Rahab? You know the story of Rahab. We know it from the book of Joshua, where she is called Rahab the... I won't fill in the blank, but you know the blank. You know what the word is. Talks about the world's oldest profession. So I think, imagine that you are in heaven, and you start meeting biblical characters. So someone introduces you to someone called Malchus, and you start thinking, Malchus, who is that? I know that name. Oh, yes, Malchus, I remember you. You're the guy that got your ear chopped off by Peter when Jesus was arrested. Ah, boy, how, what's your story? How did you end up here in heaven? Oh, and do you have a scar on your ear? What's, how, how did that work out? Wouldn't that be an interesting conversation? And then a little later, you get to another conversation, and someone says, oh, I want you to meet Eutychus. And you think, Eutychus? Who is Eutychus? And you go, oh, 
night when Paul was, I think it was in Troas, and he was speaking to a group of people, and he was leaving the next day, and he spoke on and on and on past midnight, and with all the candles and lamps in the room, it was getting stuffy, and one guy was sitting by the window, and he fell out the third-story window, and he was dead, and Paul resurrected him. You're Eutychus. Wow, interesting. What was it like to be dead? Were you really dead? What happened? Wouldn't those be some interesting conversations? And then another day you meet someone and they say, oh, I'd like to introduce you to Rahab. And you go, oh, Rahab, I know that story. You're Rahab the... <laughs> and do you put your foot in your mouth or do you stop before you give the full title that Scripture gives? Interesting. In the book of Joshua, she's called Rahab the, with the title. In the book of Hebrews, uh, in Hebrews chapter 11, she is listed as a woman of faith, but it still includes the title, Rahab the. And in the book of James... She was considered righteous, providing lodging to the spies. But again, she's called Rahab the. Matthew just calls her Rahab. Now, I'm going to suggest why a little later. We'll get back to that in a, in a minute. Well, next is Ruth. And Ruth, you say, well, at least there's one good story there. I mean, Ruth, isn't that a lovely story? A nice story about faithfulness, Ruth's faithfulness to her mother-in-law. And in faith, that story is often quoted or that phrases in there are used at, at a wedding. Where you go, I will go. Your people will be your, my people and your God, my God. Isn't that just a lovely story? Well, yes, but there is a backstory. You see, Ruth was not Jewish. Not only that, she was from the people of Moab, a Moabite. The Moabites were descendants of Lot. Lot, you remember the family who flew to the, uh, fled to the mountains when Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. And in that story, Lot was turned into a, Lot's wife was turned into a pillar of salt. So Lot and his daughters were in the mountains watching the smoldering ruins of the town that they had lived in and thinking this was a global apocalypse and thinking that everything was wiped out. And then Lot's daughters had this question, well, how are we ever going to have any children? And they figured out a way. That's all I'll tell you from the story, but you can look up that story in Genesis 18, 19. And it makes us cringe and we go, ooh. And that story is included by including Ruth, someone who is not Jewish. Matthew could have just li listed Boaz and moved on, but no, he includes the name of Ruth. And then the next lady that he includes, he actually doesn't list her by name, but we know the name, don't we? might have been less embarrassing if, if she had been named. Matthew could have just listed David and Solomon and hurried on with the list. But again, he pauses to say, remember that story? Uh, this person whose, uh, whose husband was Uriah? And you know that story of David, the famous story of his, most, his failings, a story that includes adultery and murder. And so the people reading audit automatically would have filled in the name of Bathsheba. So, there's some details. Now, other details, when you look, there's a list of kings. But in that list, there's not included just the good kings, but also a number of the evil kings. There are some lists in Israel's history, the history of the nation of Judah, some of the kings that are omitted, but when you look at the entire list, there actually are seven kings that are included that are evil kings in the genealogy. So why did he include the kings Rehoboam and Abijah and Jehoram and Ahaz and Manasseh and Ammon and Jeconiah, some of the worst kings that the nation ever had? So those are some details. that The original readers would be looking at this and saying, where on earth is this story going? So why include these details? What was Matthew up to as he was reading this, writing this genealogy in such an odd way? Well, it could have been that it was for the sake, some of it was for the sake of Mary. If you've grown up in the church or if you've been a believer for many years, you've accepted the divinity of Jesus, you believe in the virgin birth, but for people hearing the story the first time, if the story started with Mary, it would be just the story of a young girl getting pregnant before marriage and it wouldn't be a very convincing start. They'd be skeptical about the angel visit and the explanation of the virgin birth, and they would assume a very ordinary story of poor choices or someone being taken advantage of. And for skeptical readers, the details uh, in this genealogy might provide a more favorable hearing, setting up the story of Mary. It might also be 
that he intentionally includes people who are Gentiles because that gives the story a lot broader audience. And it suggests that Jesus is the Messiah not only to the Jews, but also came for people who were not Jewish. So that's another reason for um, including these details. Some might be just to raise the profile of women in a time where women didn't have many rights to be able to say, yes, in Christ there is dignity, there is equality. Foreshadowing what Paul would say a little later, in Christ there is no male or female, slave or free. And so he includes women to elevate the position of women. It could also be that he includes them because he is writing a story about grace. The detail includes the dysfunctional part of the Jewish story, very human story. Story including sexual scandal, evil rulers that led them astray, a time when uh, people were disobedient and it was so prevalent that it required a 70-year punishment to bring people to the, back to the place of restoration. So the story includes not only the proud moments, the golden age of the king David and Solomon, but some low moments as well. Details they would rather ignore, rather ignore when they tell their story. But those details are part of their story. Just like all of us have details that are part of our story that we would rather exclude. Matthew writes about Jesus, who, the Messiah, who would be called Jesus because Jesus would save people from their sins. He's not just a political savior who would change the national circumstances. He is a personal savior who would address the condition of people's hearts, who would address their messed up lives. The story of Roots tells the, received, the readers that the Messiah came for imperfect people who had messy stories. So those are some reasons. One that I really kind, find kind of intriguing is it could be that he includes these details because it becomes a springboard to his own personal testimony. Matthew is a book about identity. The identity of the Messiah, Jesus said, who do people say that I am? And he shapes this book about identity to talk about the Messiah and to ask people about their own identity and in a way to share a little bit about his own story. Remember what I said about Rahab? who was identified in the book of Joshua and Hebrews and James as Rahab the when Matthew breaks form and just calls her Rahab, is he saying something about her identity? About the Messiah's power to change who we are? What makes me wonder that is that when you read through the book of Matthew, there is another unflattering title that is used a number of times in the book of Matthew. You know what that title is? Tax Collector. Matthew. Tax Collector. Matthew tells us that Jesus was criticized by religious people because he spent time with tax collectors and sinners. And in Matthew 18, when Jesus was talking about resolving conflict, he says you do it individually with a person. If you can't do that, you do it with a small group. If you can't do that, you bring it to the gathering. And if none of that works, then you're to treat the person as you would a pagan or a tax collector. And more than anyone, Matthew knew what that felt like. He felt the contempt of people who had crossed the street to avoid getting close to him. He noticed when they rolled their eyes or made jokes about him or hurled insults at him, sometimes under their breath in passing, sometimes aloud and to his face. Like Rahab and the other women in the story, he knew what it was like to live with a label. A label through which you were insulted and shamed and excluded. And later in the book of Matthew, he writes about Jesus talking to people who are criticizing him. And Jesus says this in Matthew 21, 31 to 32. Truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. He had a special affinity with people who had a past, people who had a scandal, people who had a, some baggage, people who had a label. 
And in the genealogy, he omits Ruth's label. Maybe he figures that it's just her own story to tell. But he tells his story. And so in Matthew chapter 10, when Matthew lists the people who first followed Jesus, those 12 disciples, he intentionally says, Matthew the tax collector. It's personal. But his label is no longer in the shadows of shame. It's a springboard to his testimony because he met the Messiah, the one who would save people from their sins. And he had been changed. He was a tax collector, but a tax collector who had been changed, forgiven, and restored. We all have a label, don't we? It might have attached to us through choices that we have made, through voices that we have heard through the years, whether it be a voice of a scolding parent or a teacher or an authority or people teasing us on the playground. It might have developed through some poor choices that we have made. It might have developed through some poor habits that we've adopted and never been able to shake. But regardless how you got that label, the enemy uses that label to shame and imprison you. Oh, you might put up a hard exterior. Oh, that's just the way I am. Or you say, it doesn't bother me, but inwardly, you long for change. That's the human story. And there are parts of our story that we'd rather ignore, parts that we'd like to keep hidden, things you don't include on your resume, our past, our problems, our sin, our shame. Matthew begins this story about the Messiah, knowing that he would be introducing that question of Jesus, who do people say that I am? And Matthew tells the story of the one who can save people from their sins. And from this opening list of names that we find so dull, Matthew grips his readers with two unshakable questions. Who is this Messiah? And who am I? And the readers, they just have to keep reading. Because as they do, they come to grips with that label that's hanging over their own head. And they're intrigued by this Messiah. And like Matthew, are compelled by the call of the Messiah who said, follow me. Have you come to grips with your label? Have you answered the call to follow Jesus, the Messiah? Have you allowed him to erase that label? To take away the sting of shame? To turn into a testimony of grace? And Jesus came to save people from their sins. Now we often focus on what Jesus did to save people from the penalty of their sins. The power of Jesus to give us eternal life and we should emphasize that. But Jesus also came to save us from the power of our sins to free us from the labels that through our entire lives have imprisoned us so that we can enjoy the abundant life to which he calls us. So have you come to grips with your label? Have you met the Messiah who can release you from shame and regret and the ingrained sin patterns, sometimes from your roots, sometimes from your choices, sometimes from your habits? Jesus is the Messiah, the one who came to save people from their sins. And he said, who do people say that I am? And in asking that question, ask each one of us to come to grips with, who am I? What's my identity? And he invites us to find our identity in him. A follower of the Messiah. A child of God.